This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. When I started this show, I wanted it to be unlike any other. I wanted to talk with people about big ideas, but also about themselves in ways they never had before in public. So far, that's exactly what's happened in every episode. But I couldn't have that kind of conversation by talking to someone on Skype or on the phone. They have to be talking to me face to face in person. And that means I have to travel and find recording spaces where I can have intimate conversations like that. All of which is to say, I need your help to keep this show going. Please do me a favor. Go to unregisteredlisteners.com and become a subscriber. This isn't just a contribution. You'll become a member of a private Facebook group where you can talk with me and with guests from the show. You'll also receive access to the episodes that have been archived, which right now include the episodes with Michael Malice, Maggie McNeil, and Camille Foster. We're also rolling out unregistered merchandise, shirts, mugs, stickers, and other items featuring the unregistered and renegade university artwork. Subscribers get free or heavily discounted merchandise there. There's much more for subscribers at unregisteredlisteners.com. I hope you can help me keep these remarkable conversations going. There's another way you can participate in conversations with me like the ones on the podcast, and it's happening soon. There are a few tickets left for a special weekend event with me in Salem, Massachusetts on August 5th and 6th. During the weekend, we'll discuss many of the issues that I've talked about on the podcast, including the meaning of the Trump presidency, the current crises in colleges and universities, the politics of race, and the idea and theories that inform my work. And during the weekend, we will record a live episode of Unregistered. You can get all the information for this event and purchase tickets by going to thaddeusrussell.com slash courses. After you listen to this interview with the filmmaker David Feige, you'll probably want to see the film that he made, but you won't be able to because for reasons that will be immediately obvious, film distributors have rejected it and the media has refused to cover it. The film is called Untouchable, and I think it is one of the most important and courageous films I've ever seen. Now, I say that as someone who had not heard of David Feige or the film until just before this interview. So here's the thing, though. We are organizing screenings of the film for unregistered listeners. If you want to see it, go to thaddeusrussell.com slash untouchable and take a one-question survey about where you would like to see it. Again, that's thaddeusrussell.com slash untouchable. Meanwhile, here's my interview with David Feige. So a film recently came to my attention. I had known nothing about it. It turns out it, it came out in early 2016, and so it's been more than a year. I had never heard about it, and I found out about it just a couple of weeks ago, and I was absolutely taken with it and shocked by it, how good it was, how brave it was. And I have to say, I wasn't that shocked by the fact that I didn't know about it because it has been ignored by the media since it came out. And I think there are good reasons for that. The uh, film is called Untouchable, and its director is sitting in front of me. His name is David Feige. And uh, I immediately reached out to him and said, please come on the podcast. And thank God he said yes. So he's here to talk about this quite amazing film and brave, I think really is the word, because uh, he takes on a subject in the film that almost no one else will. And he suffered from it, I think, in some ways. And I think the film has suffered from it, but we're going to correct that right now. So David, thanks for coming on. It's my pleasure. The Unregistered Podcast. So 
How do you summarize this film? What is it about? <laughs> it's a great, that's a great question. Look, at the end of the day, it's a film about sex offenders and sex offender laws around this country. It is a chronicle of a guy whose daughter is sexually abused by their nanny who goes on a crusade to make Florida the safest state in the nation uh, by passing the harshest sex offender laws he can. It turns out he's the most powerful lobbyist in Florida. He is has extraordinary access and is very, very effective in doing this. And the film follows him, but contrasts his story with three people who are forced to live under the very laws that he has passed. And it sort of frames the question, is this right? Is what we're, are, are, are these laws effective? Answer, probably not. Um, do we want to have people with personal vendettas passing laws and personal stakes? And it's really a meditation about power, power and powerlessness. It's a study of the criminal justice system, and more importantly, the very darkest, deepest corner of the criminal justice system, a place where we are able to profoundly mistreat people because they are pariahs, because they are outcasts, because we are afraid of them and we hate them. So when you say sex offenders, you're talking about pedophiles, or you're talking about people who have been convicted of sexually, quote, abusing children. No. Um, that's a great question. No, sex, sex offenders actually is a much, much broader category, and that's something that the film explores. So yes, when you say sex offender, what jumps to your mind are the pedophiles and the terrible child abusers and the stories that you read in the press. The thing is, as the film explores, we have 800,000 people on sex offender registries right now. 800,000 Americans. Think about that. In, in Oregon, it's something like one in 85 or 90 adult men are on the sex offender registry. Wow. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And the reason for that is because what were once highly specific targeted laws, or at least imagined as highly specific targeted laws, became broader and broader and broader and began sweeping up people you know, by by the tens of thousands. Right. So, but those who are on the sex offender registry uh, include people who have been convicted of rape of adults. Is that correct? For sure. Okay. Right. So, but but your film, I'm just saying, your yeah. film focuses exclusively on sex offenders who have been convicted of sexually abusing children. Right. No. It, I think so. No. <laughs> well, there's three. There are okay. three main characters. There's John Cryer. There's a guy who is, in yeah. fact, looks dead in the camera and says, for most of my life, I've been a pedophile. Mm -hmm. There is Clyde, who you're right, also. Um, well, okay. I guess, in a way, I'm <laughs> going to concede this film? point. I, I'm going to concede this point. I think about it differently. It's so interesting. Yeah, you're right. It is interesting. And the third person, the third person did have consensual sex yeah. with an underage kid when she was yeah. when, when she herself was a teenager. I was very careful so, in my use of words. I you're said right. they were convicted. You're 100% right. Oh, good. Yeah. I, so I know your film better than you do. You do. <laughs> no. No, no. I think it actually is interesting that you don't think of it that, that way. You're right. Right. You've internalized a different view of it, a different narrative about your own film, about your own narrative, which is quite interesting. And I think it that's, is. I think maybe, maybe we're jumping ahead here, but I think possibly the culture is forcing you to do that in some ways, right? Because it, again, it is so taboo. Right. What you've done is so wrong, right? Yeah. That maybe you are policing yourself and that's forcing yourself point. to even change the narrative itself. So it, just, yeah. just in terms of the facts, right? right? You agree, right? These, everybody in your film, and the film is entirely about, I believe, people who have been convicted of sexually abusing, I think is the word, usually in the law, right? Yeah. Children. Children. People, yeah. Uh, people under 18. Okay. You're completely right. All right. That. And it focuses, you said there's, right, there's, there are five personal narratives. Right. No, six, three, maybe. Three big ones. Oh, well, including Lauren and Ron. Yeah. So, right. So, so it starts with and kind of revolves around this family or this father and a daughter duo, and they're quite a duo. Yes, Ron Book is this Florida lobbyist you mentioned, and he he had been the most powerful lobbyist or one of the most powerful lobbyists in the state of Florida for many years before all the all of this happened. Right. Right. Okay. And um, still is, by the way. Yeah. And his daughter Lauren, who is now twenty nine, or I guess when the film was made, she was twenty nine, so she's about thirty thirty one, who is now a state senator. Yes, correct. She is. Okay. Oh yes. Um, now what happens is I. Correct me if I'm wrong, but according to what I saw, the story is that Lauren, when she was a teenager, late teenager, she told her father that she had been abused by their nanny, her nanny, right. who had essentially raised her, largely raised her for many, many years as Correct. a child, right? And some of the abuse was just violent and some of the abuse was sexual. 
And her father, Ron Book, then took it upon himself to go on a crusade to not only punish Waldina Flores, who was an immigrant from Honduras, to put not only put her in prison for as long as he possibly could, but to incarcerate every person in the country or possibly the world who has ever abused a child in any way at all. And of course, that category, that definition gets broadened in many ways over time. We'll talk about that too. What does sexual abuse actually mean, right? It becomes quite capacious. Yep. Yep. So it starts to include all sorts of stuff. And he's very successful. So within, what, a year or two, they are passing laws. In they this... begin to pass laws very quickly, and they, it just mushrooms over, a, over the course of many, multiple years. So this is all going down, basically, when did it start? I shot the film over about three, two and a half to three years. Um, so 20, what, 13 to 2016, there, thereabouts. It was a little less of actual shooting, and, and we were in and out of Florida. But yeah, that was the that that was the period of time he was already in full swing. Right, they had already passed a whole bunch of bills by the time we got there. But um, you know, they had already established Ron and Lauren established a foundation mm-hmm. called Lauren's Kids, which is uh, one of the most uh, gets more money gets more money than almost any other foundation in the state of Florida hmm. from the Florida legislature. Mm-hmm. They just, in fact, appropriated another. I don't know how much. It was, I think, a million, two million. It was a lot of money. The Essentially, it's a lobbying group. gets <laughs> money from the legislature to lobby for laws, to crack down harsh, more harshly on sex offenders. They would say that they are educational. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so I think I looked it up. I mean, I think they started their, le- their legislative lobbying on this issue, I think, in the early aughts, in yeah, the early 2000s, right. I think. And they've had... Many, many laws passed over that time yes. since then, you know, that have so severely criminalized sexual abuse of children that it's become pretty much totalitarian. There's a totalitarian regime in Florida mm-hmm. and really in much of the country for people who have been convicted of these crimes. And then there's another person who's sort of part of this crusade against uh, sex offenders, and her name is Judy Judy Coronet. Coronet. Yeah who founded and ran this group called Predator Patrol. Is yes. that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I immediately, when I heard that name of a group, I thought of uh, perverts. Because in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, that was the big scare. was right. about perverts. Perverts, right. Middle-aged, lurking, usually lurking was, perverts. Usually it was middle-aged men who lurked in, you know, yeah. um, pub- in parks and school grounds and, and would snatch up children and then molest them. And right. So, and a lot of people were put in prison then, too, for that. Not nearly as many as now but quite a few. So she runs this organization and has for quite a while, right, that literally gets on in cars and they sort of patrol neighborhoods, they drive around neighborhoods, and they there's this amazing scene early in the movie, I yeah. think, where she is going through this, what looks like a black neighborhood, a predominantly black neighborhood, poor neighborhood, and there's a bunch of black teenagers in the street and she just rolls up to them and says, and shows her a list uh, with pictures of all the registered sex offenders in the neighborhood and says, hey guys, you ever seen any of these people? And they go, Oh shit, that's Tammy, right? right. And mm-hmm. and oh, well, that bitch, she's right down the street. Right. Yeah, and, and they all freak out. And you can just, I could just see like this mob, the herd, the, the herd mob mentality. Yeah, the, and yeah. you know, it's funny because I grew up in a neighborhood very similar to that. Actually, I was like one of the few white kids in my neighborhood, and <laughs> I mean, it was there was that. I mean, something could turn, and you could become bad in some way or vulnerable in some way. And Target. There were times when I would have rocks thrown at our house by a bunch of neighborhood kids who were my friends two days ago. But, you know, it, when they're kids, right, it's so it, things like that can happen. And you have this woman who's in her 30s or 40s, you know, driving around. She's a pretty smart person, too. Pretty sophisticated, actually. Yeah. Inciting. Inciting this stuff. I mean, God knows what could have happened to Tammy after that. Or she would say educating. Yeah. Preventing and educating. Yeah, it's quite something. Well, it's interesting that everybody side. takes refuge in those in, in that in, in those terms. Yes. Yeah, right? s- side yeah. note, although yeah. maybe it's not a side note, uh, you know, I, when that scene happens, which is early in the film, I think, oh, here comes here comes the race narrative, right? Because everything about criminal justice these days is framed around race. Right. And then about two thirds of the movie, I thought, wait a minute, I haven't thought about race myself. I haven't thought about race in a long, long time watching this film. Gosh, maybe this is pan-racial or cross-racial, this phenomenon. And I think it is. And in fact, yeah. I don't know if you know, do you know it Marie is. Gottschalk? Do you know this scholar who's worked a little bit on this? She's a bit, yeah. really great book called Caught about mm-hmm. criminal justice and mass incarceration. Right. And 
And she in there was one of the, I think the first scholar to say, hey, one of the, one of the main drivers, not the only one, but one of the main driver, major drivers of mass incarceration in the last 10, 20 years has been what your film is about, the mass prosecution of sex offenders. Right. And she says, she argues, and that has nothing, little or nothing to do with race because the evidence shows that there is no racial That's discrimination right. or very little there, right? It's not evident in any way. Okay, so we have those three. Sorry, I will let you talk in a minute. No, no, it's great. <laughs> I, I was going to say we can take great comfort in that we're draconian toward all. Yeah. Uh, or not any comfort right. in that. Yeah, no, yes. I mean, I studied your film. I mean, I really, I think <laughs> I can you can see, tell. No, yeah. <laughs> I can see that. It, and I really like that. You're right. That when I mean, we'll get back to the insight about it's all children and why I did or didn't think, it, think mm-hmm. of it that way. But mm-hmm. that's really yeah, yeah. interesting. And so we have the three sort of um, crusaders. We right. have Ron and Lauren, mm-hmm. and then we have Judy. Right. Um, and and then they're very much a, con- a study in contrast in that, I mean, I, I, you know, Ron is so polished and so political and so smooth, and you literally see him glad- glad-handing his way through the Capitol, I kid you not, shaking hands with the governor, slapping the backs of Supreme Court justices. And then there's Judy, who, like, lives in a world, a demimonde, of like biker bars Bikers, yeah. and leather jackets and motorcycles, and they do this thing at this very opposite. It's why I was so attracted to this, the contrasts in those characters, because Judy exists in such an interesting and completely different place from Ron, and yet they're in many ways on the same journey, motivated by the same things, looking to do looking to do similar stuff. Yeah, there's a great scene where Judy is in that bar recruiting a bunch of bikers yep. to go out and patrol the streets, you know, yep. finding perverts. And I was thinking, God, the Hell's Angels would not have approved of this at all. And back in the 1960s, in fact, they were the ones on the receiving end of the of the war against crime. So we've got those three doing God's work. Oh, by the way, Ron Book is quite. They're all amazing characters, but Ron Book, the word that came to mind, I don't think he's Jewish, is he? He is Jewish. Oh, boy. Okay. Not to stereotype too much in this interview, but the word that came to mind for me was he's a mocker. A mocker, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> was he's it? a kingmaker. He is. He was once described to me, somebody, I don't remember who, somebody said to me, you know how you think about like the power of the old five families in New York? He goes, Ron's all five. Mm-hmm. He he just makes everything happen. And there's a moment in the film where we're talking to a legislator who says this thing that I actually have trouble processing. He says, oh, about 60% of all the bills that come through here have Ron's fingerprints on them. And I was like, wait, of all the bills? Like on everything? He goes, yeah, on everything. Mm-hmm. Which is astounding. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I kept thinking was, is Florida just sui generis in this way? Because we keep hearing about, you know, those of us in the in the great north, in the liberal enclaves like Los mm-hmm. Angeles and New York, that, oh, well, Florida, they're just like a different country. They have all these crazy right-wing laws. And that's to some extent true. But as we'll talk about later, I mean, this is spreading, has been spreading yeah. across the country. But oh, yes. Florida may be a leader in it. But so, but yeah, Ron Book, um, and, and you do, the film does a phenomenal job of just following him in the closest way. I mean, you're really inside of his life. I mean, there's actually a scene where you show him shaving with his shirt off in the bathroom. And I'm thinking, God, I wouldn't have my hairy chest and back on film like that. But you really, just the way he moves through the world. Right. He's a macher, right? Like he he's, he's gets things done. And I've known men like that. Yeah. In fact, I used to be related to one. And uh, he's a much nicer version of Ron Book. But yeah. Ron, by the way, to, yeah. like, were you to cleave this whole thing off? Mm-hmm. Ron is incredibly charming, incredibly like that, engaging. That's part of the. It's part, that's of, part of the thing. Yeah. The thing. I mean, he is. He's one of those guys who is just really used to getting his way, in part because he can charm his way or talk his way into anything. It's very impressive and and, and disarming. Absolutely, yeah. And then and then his daughter Lauren, who is similar, and she's you know got to say, I mean. Their relationship is really interesting, and I have a lot of thoughts about it. She, you know, you could say in in one fundamental way, she's taken after her dad in that she wants to get things done. She has her own crusade, which is about her own experience. She wants to put these people in prison. She has a little bit of a change of heart toward the end of the film, but fundamentally she still wants a major crackdown on all of them. She has a career. She now has a career in politics. She has this major foundation, which is this lobbyist group that gets all this money from the legislature. But she ha- and she's also very, very talented. She's very good at this, right? She speaks really. Well. She speaks yeah. like not just a politician, but a good politician. She's, she's she merges very well rehearsed. Also, she, yeah, I bet. Lauren. That comes. She's, I mean, she really has her talking. This this has become. This is gelled 
for Lauren into something that she's written about extensively, talked about extensively. She is very, very polished on this subject. Yep. Um, in it, I think that's what you're that's what you're sensing. Yeah, but I mean, to. as when the film was shot, she was 29 years old, and boy, I mean, she's impressive. Yeah. I am no fan at all, right. but she's really good at what she does. And and so, again, th- their relationship is really quite fascinating. But I want to talk about that in a second. But And then so you got those three. And then you got on the other side, you have three people. You tell their stories who have been, what do you want to say? I don't know, victimized. They have been they are they are convicted sex offenders who are on the right. registry and have been. And you f- you follow them and tell their stories and what they how they have suffered. And that's where the film I think is going to change a lot of minds. I think you're going to actually find a pretty receptive audience, even among sort of so. mainstream kind of liberal or conservative types. You know, I, I think maybe a lot of NPR listeners actually would be sympathetic enough to those three people to start to rethink the sex offender laws and the registry in particular. So you start off with Shauna Baldwin, right. who is this blonde, white, pretty woman who has two kids, yep. and she was convicted of having sex with a 14-year-old boy when she herself was... 19th birthday, yeah. She was 19. Well, 19. She was 19. 19, so there you go. I mean, so 19, wom- 19-year-old she, woman right. with a 14-year-old boy. There are very few Americans, I think, who would look at that, look at her story, and look at what she was convicted of, and think that she should be punished at all. Well... not I mean, Well, some, but I think the majority would not. Well, what's interesting, I... I, I I think that's generally right. Uh, what's most interesting, I think that's even more the case when you listen to her story mm-hmm. and you get into the specifics. I mean, there's this disarming moment. Look, she's this sort of itinerant teenager. She winds up. She winds up in Arizona. She, you know, her mom kicks her out of the house. She winds up in Arizona. She's living with this sort of motley crew of people. You know, that are sort of a little bit misfits, a little bit. You know, don't have places to go, and there's this, and there's this boy, and he's sort of in this, in in that crowd, and they have this party, and they're drinking, and there's this moment where she says, like, and and then he kissed me, and it was like, oh my god, he likes me, and it's the most disarming, young, authentic thing, and you're just like, oh god, oh, I, I get it, and he says to her, I hope you don't think I'm taking advantage of you because you're drunk. And she's like, I, I don't think that. And then they go and they have sex. And, of course, somebody else reports it to the mom, to this kid's mom. And the boy, by the way, never really, never wanted this prosecuted I was gonna, I was ask at that. all. No, yeah. she, I mean, in fact, the mom apparently said, like, you know, my son hates me. Um, I, think it, I think it's safe to say that almost universally uh, among boys, that's cause for a high five. Yeah. Right? Well, there, yeah, there's a funny, I think no, there's a South I've, Park. I've very, very <laughs> few boys would consider themselves to be victims yeah, in I that think case. There's, right? there's, a very funny South, there's a very funny South Park that takes, takes right. up that theory. But anyway, so she, the mom initially says, leave, just get out of town. She does. Four or five months later, summons arrives in the mail. She travels back. She gets on a Greyhound bus, goes back to Arizona to show up at this court date. They've charged her with this aggravated sex offense. She gets put in jail, and she's basically offered the chance to plead guilty, serve a year, serve a year of which I think she does six or eight months, and be on the registry for life, and have lifetime lifetime probation, lifetime on the registry. That's the thing about the sex registry. You're on it for life. Now, okay, so explain Certainly what that means. A lot, most people don't know what this is. What does it mean to be on the registry? It is an extraordinary. It is an extraordinary burden. Now, I should say that every state does this differently. There are a large number of states that are just sort of one category. You're on it. You're on it for life. Done. End of sentence. There are a few states that have what are called tiered registries that take into account the nature of the offense and so on and so forth and you know, have different levels of requirements depending on what level you are and how long you stay. Some are like 15 years, 25 years, life. Some are 10, 10, 20 life. Some are 10, 10, 20, 25. So there, every state does it a little bit differently. I should note that Shauna would wind up being a level three or the most serious 
in almost every state because of the age of the victim. Wow. So, which is kind of an amazing... Regardless of the fact that she herself was a teenager when it happened. Correct. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there are thousands and thousands of these... And that the boy never considered himself to be a victim. Correct. And thousands of these Romeo and Juliet cases around the country. Mm -hmm. Um, But what it... So what it means is... First of all, in almost all in almost all of them, you're, it's very public. There is literally you type the name in, you get that's, the crime. Well, that's crime the purpose prediction. of it, right? Yeah, is well, to make them public. Isn't well, it? yes and no, yes and no. So there were two different there are two different laws, right? There was originally let's have a registry so law enforcement knows where to go when something happens. It's the that moment in Law and Order SVU where they're like, we've got eleven we've got eleven perverts within three blocks. Let's check them out. Right? Law and Order SVU, Ron Book's favorite TV show. It, it, Not only that, <laughs> he says in the film it's his favorite thing to do is to watch Law and, Law and Order SVU. It is an amazing which moment, isn't I it? I think might be significant. I think you do too. Uh, well, yeah. I included it in the fi- I included it in the film. I thought it was a, a great character, an amazing character. Well, I think it might explain a and, lot too. And having him, yeah, well, yeah. having him watch, and there's this wonderful moment in the in the in the film where a victim is recanting their testimony, saying, "I lied. He didn't really do it." And he looks at me and he says, "She's lying." Mm-hmm. Meaning, meaning, I don't believe the recantation. I think he, I think he did it, and mm-hmm. it's just, I mean, it just sort of gives you a wonderful look inside, inside his head and his thought process. But the the registration means a lot of means a lot of things. Obviously, you're on a database for law enforcement. You're obviously you're on a, a, a website, publicly accessible website, so that the whole world knows that you're a sex offender, which provokes all kinds of all kinds of things, all kinds of shunning behavior, as you would imagine. Because you're a registered sex offender, you are subject to what are called reg- residency restriction laws. These are astounding. They're all over the country. They're the ones where you can't live within a thousand feet of a school, a bus stop, a parking lot, um, you know, a, a playground, whatever. It makes much of the city uninhabitable. It makes almost them. all of Miami completely uninhabitable. Right. So much so that hundreds of sex offenders are relegated to living literally in this outdoor parking lot in an industrial. In, in an industrial zone in the city, and we shot a good chunk of the yeah, film there. There's a, just a, I mean, so much of the film just is 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 literally breathtaking. Uh, Thank you. To Thanks. to see what happens to these people, but there's uh, one of the guys who you interview who lives in that parking lot, right, yeah. forced there by the by the law, says, I assume he's, I don't know if he's telling the truth, but I assume he is, that he was convicted of having sex with a teenage girl when he was a teenager. I forget yes. the exact ages, but she was like 15 Philippe. and he was 17 or something like that, right? F- yeah. Or 18. Philippe, yeah. Right. He and he has said he'd been living in this lot for... Several years. And years. by the way, you know, I, you know, you want to hear something? I went back. So I had promised these guys when I started making the movie, we literally showed up in this parking lot one night out of the blue, right? And I started walking around saying, hey guys, look, I'm David Faya. I'm interested in this. I'm going to want to make a documentary and started talking to people. And one of the things that I promised them very early on, I said, look, if when I get this thing done, I'll come back and I'll, sh- you know, I'll make sure you get to see it. And obviously, they can't go to lots of places. They're home. The only thing to do, I realized at some point, was to bring the film to them. And so last year, hmm. I actually rented a mobile projection unit and set up a, a screen, an inflatable screen in the parking lot hmm. um, and, uh, and, and showed them all the film. And that guy is still there. Jesus. Still there. Still living in his van. By the way, crazy bit that didn't really make the film. His father, he was so, he, his father. When it became clear that he could no longer live at home, uh, they had had an apartment that they rented. Gave up the apartment and lived with him in the minivan. The two of them, his dad, who wouldn't abandon him, lived with him for about a year, a year and a half, in the minivan wow. in the back. Yeah. So just to keep him company, just to I yeah, mean, just because he to, didn't want to, he didn't want to turn him, he just didn't want to turn him out I mean, to the streets, right, right, yeah, yeah. and he uh, said, forget it, I'm, I'll, I'll do this, um, and that, so that's Philippe, yeah. that's his name, yeah, yeah. right, um, but you also follow Clyde Newton, yep, right, gosh, who right. we met that very first night, mm-hmm. that very first night, I'm talking, to, I'm talking to Clyde, and I'm sort of saying, hey, so you know, how'd you wind up out here, and tell me your story, and. You know, one of the things that people ask a lot is, you know, was it hard to make the film? Was it hard to find these subjects? No, it wasn't at all. It's a, it's one of those things you learn when you're a public defender. Like, if you're just willing to listen, it's amazing how many, how often 
people are willing to talk and share what's happened to them, and particularly people who are profoundly wronged, mm -hmm. who no one's ever listened to. If you just sit there and say, I'm, I'm here, I'm open, talk to me. Yeah. Um, well, there's 800,000 of them. Yeah. So they're, well, hard, they're actually not hard to find, right? It's, that, is, that is completely we're, true. We're, there were hundreds at this very parking lot. But that, do you want to hear? Do you want, sure. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's, you want to cover it later, but yeah. literally that very first night, Clyde's, Clyde's there. And he's saying, oh, yeah, well, I just got, you know, I just got back out because I, uh, I got four years in prison for a technical violation. Right. And I was like, oh, yeah, what happened? He said, well, I was eight minutes late for my curfew. Now, I'm going to digress for one quick second and just say this is another thing. So in a lot of places, when you're on probation, you've got to wear a GPS monitor. you got to check in with probation or with the police department regularly. When I was shooting at this place in Oklahoma, there was this guy, David, didn't make the movie, camping in the woods, camping in the woods, who walked 14 miles downtown to downtown Oklahoma City and 14 miles back every week to draw a circle on a map hmm. for the cops to show them where he was going to be that week. It took him all freaking day. And if he had missed just a single one, they would just would have put him back in prison. Like he was literally living under a tarp with a campfire in the woods outside of, out, out in the in this sort of little wooded shrubby area. Um, outside of Oklahoma Yeah, City. it is truly a totalitarian regime for these people. It is um, absolutely extraordinary. Not only physically, right, yeah. but also psychologically, because right. their very thoughts are under constant scrutiny, and errant thoughts are punished. Absolutely. So they're all in group counseling, they're all in therapy, and if they say they're, they're subject to polygraphs. Right. It's not just group counseling. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, that is true. They're all required to do that. In Oklahoma, where Shauna, where, where, where Shauna was living, where this guy David was living in the, was living in the woods, you ha as th two or four times a year, you have to take polygraphs where they ask you all this stuff. Have you done anything deviant? Have you thought anything deviant? Like all of this, all of this stuff. And I should I should note, you have to pay for them. Right. Sha and if you can't pay for them, bye bye. Shauna estimated that she has spent thirty five thousand dollars just on all of this stuff that she's required to do over the years. Right. right? Which which I want to put in context. This is someone who's had fourteen or fifteen different jobs. This is a woman mm -hmm. who is unbelievably bright, unbelievably industrious, mm -hmm. has done every imaginable job. Mm -hmm. Right. Has worked at Sonic at, at, at a restaurant. Has worked, you know, like all over the place. Gets fired from job after job when they find out sort of where she is, although she discloses. A lot of times she has disclosed and managed to keep jobs for long periods of time. But the most she's ever made is like 10 or $11 an hour. Right. When you're making 10 or $11 an hour and you got two kids oh, yeah. that, you're taking, that you're taking care of, yeah. like putting together you know, $800 yeah. for a polygraph and $40 a month for group, yeah. That's tough. So Shauna is obviously sympathetic. I think there are very, very few people in this country who think that she should have been punished at all, much less the way she has been punished. So that's kind of an easy one, and I'm not accusing you of taking the easy road here because you don't in the movie, but you do open the film with her, and you kind of right. much, much of it is centered around her, and I understand why. She's part of what you call the Rome, Romeo and Juliet cases, mm -hmm. uh, the older teenager having sex with the younger teenager and then right. end, ending up in the sex registry, registry forever and going to prison, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I think that's the easiest sell on this stuff, right? Agreed. Because they are not pedophiles. I mean, according to most people's definition of that term. I mean, and that's just clearly egregious. And there are many, many thousands of them, right? Oh yeah, many. Thousands. We don't have there. There are no real good estimates. It's funny mm -hmm. because I, I've been trying to push um, uh, one of the guys, one of the guys in the film, Eric Janis, who is a wonderful, yeah. wonderful scholar in uh, in in Minnesota. I've been trying to get Eric and some other some other academics to really do a deep dive into the numbers so that we have good good estimates of, of how many of these really qualify as these Romeo and Juliet cases. Because the, the detractors claim that it's virtually nil, but my estimation is that it is far from, is far from that. And what's interesting is when I say, oh, I was astounded at how many f stories like this I heard, and people are like, oh yeah, everybody says that, but it's not true. I'm a lawyer, I went, I pulled the papers. I verified all of these. I verified all of these ones, at least with the people I talked to. So while it, my information is entirely anecdotal at this point, I suspect that those numbers are much higher than we think. So I think I, I suspect that that 
that application of the law will get changed yep. in part because of your film, I think, you know, but I, I think that's so. going to, because that's, again, it's an easy sell. I think people are going to immediately see that this is not right. This is not, it is in a sense, a perversion of mm-hmm. this, this other law. So, but then it gets tougher, right? When we look at other cases and we right. think about the subject more deeply. And I, what I want to do here in this interview is tell you that the film is phenomenal. And I hope that everyone in this country sees it tomorrow. <laughs> But I also want to push even further than you do. I mean, sure. as, as many incredibly courageous risks as you take. I mean, it's. I actually want to go a little further with this. But so there's Clyde Newton. Right. Okay. So he was convicted of sex of uh, sex offense for how old was he when he touched he touched his he touched his step stepdaughter who was how, I think seven or nine okay. years old who was very young mm-hmm. and yeah. so he was obviously an adult yes. at the time. Yes. I don't remember, but it's not. There wasn't actual sexual intercourse with no, her. I it was, it no, was a touching of her was, vagina, yeah, I believe. Is I that believe right? That's right. Okay. So hmm, there you go. That's a little tougher for you, you know, to get that across to make Clyde a sympathetic figure. Mm-hmm. I think you do by the end of the film, and I'm not going to spoil the ending because it's one of the most stunning parts of the film. His full story doesn't come out till the end, and it's really something and very, very important. So as you said, he was imprisoned. He was imprisoned. He was originally out. charged with a capital offense. Wow. With a capital offense because of the child's age. He pled guilty, went to prison for a bunch of years, got out, was on this Florida, this probation stuff with the ankle bracelet, forced to, uh, for a while, found a place, then was forced to give up his home by the, uh, by the residency restrictions. Lived in the parking lot. Wound up living in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. And he stands for a different proposition. I'm not nobody which is to say there's you can feel some empathy I think for for Shauna and the entire constellation of what happened to her in the context of the 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 act she committed. With Clyde it's a little more complicated mm-hmm. as you as you rightly point out. But what's amazing about Clyde is how the system has engaged with him. Right. And so that going back to that very first that very first night uh, so he says, oh, well, I got four years. And I said, oh, you know, what happened? He said, oh, well, I was eight minutes late for curfew. Right. And I said, right, right, okay. So, And what were the other <laughs> technicals? Because, you know, I've done per- yeah. parole hearings before. I said, yeah, yeah, what were the other technical specs? And he said, there weren't any. And I said, no, 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 no. But, like, I understand you might have pled to, you know, specification two, but what were the other ones? And he said, no, that was, that was it. And I looked at him and he says, do you want to see my papers? Mm-hmm. And I look and I say, I would very much like to see your papers, Clyde. And he leaves. We're standing in the middle of this parking lot. He leaves. He goes over. He's got a backpack. He's literally living on the ground in essentially a cardboard box. Uh, like, and, he's, and he rummages around and he comes back and he hands me this paper. And it's his appeal. It's a copy of his appeal. And I'm reading through, these, through this appeal. It's fairly brief. And it literally, the argument on the appeal is a single eight-minute curfew violation cannot justify a four-year sentence. He was eight minutes late to a meeting with his parole officer. No, he was no, oh. he was oh. eight minutes late to get back to the parking lot. Oh, where he is required to sleep, and it's all geofenced. The thing is, he the only job Clyde could find was twenty-five or thirty miles away. He had to take two buses and a train to get all the way down to the car wash where he worked. Mm-hmm. And on this particular day, the bus the, the bus got the bus was late. He had actually called. He says he had called his probation officer to explain. He's freaking out. It's after hours. They're not there. And by the time he gets back, his uh, ankle bracelet has gone off, and uh, it shows that he had, that that he didn't get back into the geofenced area right. until eight minutes until okay. eight minutes late. And they put him in prison for four years. Four, and uphold it on appeal. Four years, four years for being eight minutes late. Okay. So I think that's an easy sell, too. And that, by the way, one of three technical violations they imposed on Clyde. Mm. The first one, the first one, he gets out of prison. He goes to find compliant housing. He goes to Miami to try to find compliant housing, can't find anything, runs out of money, calls his probation officer, says, look, I don't have enough money to get back to, I think it was uh, Tampa where he was. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to like panhandle, scrounge around, I'm going to see what I can do. And I, and then of course I'll come back. They violate him for, they violate him for that. That gets overturned on appeal, but he still does three years before it's overturned on appeal. So, and you show in the film a study done in California that I think shows that 90% of sex offenders who were put back in prison were done so for for technical violations That's right. like this, not for sex offenses, just for doing things like what Clyde did, being late to a meeting or something like that. That's exactly right. So I think that's an easy sell too. 
in the film. I think that most Great. Americans would agree with you that this is, here it is, an excessive application of the law. Maybe. Yeah. But I'll tell you this. There is a big, there is, I don't know that there's a consensus, but there is certainly a large group of people sure. who believe that once you've done something bad to a kid, there is no punishment that it's a, that is enough that we should put you back as often as quickly and for whatever reason as, that we can. And by the way, Lauren Lauren says say, the same thing. Well, I was going to say, but even Lauren Book it isn't there with that, right? So I think it's a minority. I think Ron, the Ron books don't you, don't you think they're a minority? No, Lauren literally said Lauren's view, uh, echoed by Ron, and uh, is it's not a question of if they reoffend; it's a question of when. And so what we need to do is put them back in prison as fast as we can for whatever reason we can. Well, I thought she sort of changes her mind a little bit about this, a, a that she bit. doesn't want to have these extreme applications, these very, very rigid applications of the law, yeah. which ends up putting them back in prison because she wants them to be rehabilitated. Right. Right. He doesn't. Ron does not want them to be rehabilitated. He wants them, as Morton Downey said about criminals, what we need to do is treat them like dogs, put them in the cage, and then kick the cage. That's basically what Ron Book right. wants to do to them. Lauren sort of changes her mind, right? So anyway, I think that, I think that that's a fairly easy sell, okay, okay. To, to the American public. Sure. Okay. That we shouldn't be putting them back in prison for being eight minutes late. Okay. Then there's John Cryer, yes. who's your third uh, victim, you know, sex offender that you, who you follow in this. And he's convicted uh, first of possession of child pornography, right. right? And then again for possession of child pornography, and then once for crossing state crossing lines, state lines for the with purpose. The to have sex with a minor. Um, one of those sting, one of those internet type was sting that, cases. I don't think it's, you'd say, say this in the film, but was that one of these entrapment cases where it a cop a, posed as a girl and. Uh, I don't remember Lord who him. was a police officer on the other end. I think it was. It was a guy that he had been in prison with was like, hey, I know this. I know this girl. You know, we should. So, but I do think, yeah, but it was it was one of those internet, one, one of those sort of internet correspondence. Which is things. very, very common. So yeah. cops pose as children on the internet and tell these guys that, yeah, meet me at this hotel at 8 o'clock, and then he gets there and the cops are I have to think him. there are far more cops posing as, posing as sexually active young kids than there are actually sexually active young kids trolling the internet, looking for old men to have sex. Oh, yeah, no, we know this. I mean, there's, <laughs> we know. I mean, you can see police departments reporting on this all, with right. great pride. You know, they're not actually hiding it all over the country all the time. Yeah, it's straight up entrapment, but they get away with it because it's, again, it's pedophiles. So we have to do everything possible to get rid of them. So he's, um, well, yeah, that's interesting. You know, I mean, possession of child pornography. Yes. And what happened to John Cryer? He went to prison and then what? And then How long got, did he go? He was in prison for many, many years, right? Uh, he, would, he got 12 years the second time. He got, I think, three, two or three years the first time. He got a couple of years the first time. He got out yeah. and he reoffended. And look, Cryer in the film. So reoffended by possessing more child pornography. Correct. Possessing. And crossing, and crossing state lines with mm -hmm. the intent to, to, yeah. to have sex with a minor. Cryer exists to pose the really hard problem in the film. Because look, he looks dead in the camera, as I said. Mm -hmm. He looks dead in the camera, and it's kind of chilling, and says, mm -hmm. look, for most of my life, I've been a pedophile. Yep. Um, and then not only has he been a pedophile, because there are some who never, uh, who, who never offend, um, but he committed crimes mm -hmm. and was caught and convicted and charged um, right. and, and incarcerated for those crimes. So he was never... More than once. He was never convicted of or even accused of having ever touched a child. No. So He's, he has John no, Cryer right. went to prison for his thoughts. You could, say, you could say that. You could say that he went to prison for engaging with his sexual preference, if you want. There are lots of ways to put it. There, there are lots of interesting ways to put it. Your, uh, one's views of sexual plasticity... There, there's a lot of discussion about that. What seemed clear to me, and again, in the film, he talks about this and I think, think some really interesting ways, um, and literally talks about how it came to be that he was sexually attracted to children. Yeah, another great moment in the film, he talks about how this sort of became imprinted <clears throat> yeah. on him. He saw, he saw his cousins having sex in the bed with him when they were all children, yeah. right? And that's, and he became- that's sort of what he identified the, with. The girl in that became his object, yeah. his sexual, of, of yeah. sexual desire. Uh, which also, again, sort of, I hate this word, but I'm gonna use it anyway, humanizes this, at least 
uh, desire. Play. We can understand it. We can well, understand yeah. that because we all have sort of imprints. There are certain things that turn us on right. that we can trace back to some moment in our childhood, right? We saw this thing, and since then we've, been, we've wanted right. that thing, right. and that was his thing. Unfor- unfortunately for him, it was the very wrong thing. Right. I mean, I don't know. It's not it's not there to suggest, like I said, to suggest some biological, biological or psychological basis. But rather, look, the film explores go to, you know, and part of perhaps why it hasn't been seen in the ways that I'd like is it goes to these very dark, complicated questions and tries to confront them head on. And the film doesn't judge. You know, I, I think one of the, the feedback that I've gotten which I'm really pleased with, is everybody says, God, it was so balanced. It was so <laughs> like, it really showed both sides. And by the way, when I showed it to Ron the first time, you know, I was very, I was very nervous before finally showing the, film, showing the film to Ron. And at least the first time when he, when he first saw it, you know, he and Lauren showed up in New York. We had rented a little small screening room. They showed up with popcorn. I'm like, this is not really a popcorn movie. <laughs> yeah, see, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> that really is. And, but, you know, there's this long pause and he goes, I love it. I love it. It's great. I think he saw a different film than I saw. He saw it. Well, I, his his <laughs> feelings have, have evolved. I don't think he likes it at the, at this point. But what, but what I asked him, which was the most important thing to me as a filmmaker, was I said, look, I want to know whether you felt that it honored your point of view, that it gave you voice to say the things that you felt it was important to say. And he said, yes. I said, I understand. You may not like the balance of the film. You may not like that I also gave time to people you loathe and people who you think should never be heard from, uh, never be seen, never be talked to. I get all that. What I want to know is what I showed of you, did that accurately reflect who you are, what you believe, and what you wanted to say? Yeah. And he said, yes. Oh, I think so, too. And Right. And, <laughs> and just to me, I, yeah, yeah that, was, that was important because <clears throat> it is a... Like I said, it's a film that goes to a lot of really, really dark, complicated places. You know, really, arguably, the darkest corner of the criminal justice system. Right. It's just that when I see his story, I see, or I think, I'm sure he sees, he sees a crusader who is righting wrongs in the world. Right. Whereas I see, what I, I, I think I see, is a crusader who is doing something that has nothing to do with the world outside of him. It has to do with his own internal drama. He's playing out some epic drama yes. inside of him, and unfortunately, it is almost a biblical expiation of guilt. And yeah, yeah. Well, okay, yeah. I think I think guilt is certainly part of it. I think there's even more than that possibly going on. Maybe the most fascinating thing about it. It's hard to say that because there's so many things that I like about it. But one of the, for, for me, the most fascinating thing, and you don't, you never make this explicit at all. But you spend so the camera spends so much time watching this that it just. It hits me throughout the film, the relationship between Ron and Lauren, and in particular to me, what I see as their, what's the word, almost celebration of her victimhood, her suffering, the, the abuse, and their, their quest to yes. rectify this, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's like a, I remember there's this moment where he's in, you're watching him in his office, Ron in his office, and he, there's this painting that they clearly had commissioned of them embracing each other and she's crying into his chest. And it's this, you know, it's this elaborate sort of post, uh, sort of pop modern uh, art uh, painting. And, you know, it's just, they love her victimhood. They have embraced it profound. <laughs> they have, uh, Ron, I think Ron would say, we took this horrible thing and we have made a, a, a beautiful redemptive thing about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they have this intensely dyadic relationship. They have <laughs> this intensely intertwined, <laughs> bonded, bonded relationship. Lauren is very much present with him. The offices of Lauren's kids is in Ron Book, mm-hmm. LLC, Ron Book lobbying firm like Lauren's office is in there. They have Lauren's kids stuff everywhere. So they work together. They are they are very psychologically bonded. And I think that, you know, part of this undoubtedly comes from this, what he, I think he would probably say, was this revelatory moment in which she reveals this reveals this abuse. And he has a moment of saying this is going to be the thing that will that will I will deal with for the rest of my life, and I am never going to stop until I 
somehow right this unrightable mm-hmm. wrong. Yeah, so he's he's pretty, I think he would call it guilt. I mean, you think he feels a lot of guilt, and he's open yeah. about that. He, he is. He recognizes that as the driving force for him. So here's the thing, though. So pedophilia is a term that was invented in the late 19th century. There was no pedophilia anywhere in the world before then. We just didn't have any conception of it. And so what we now, if we look back in time and we saw particular things happening, sure. we would we would call it pedophilia, but the people at the time did not. And so as a crime, not as an idea... All, not to over-historian the, historia, that's the historian what I, here, but look, Biedemeyer, like there, our entire modern modern conception of childhood mm-hmm. is childhood is a relatively modern post-industrial construction. Totally. Not to be all, you know... No, but, l- please be totally. But, yes. But you know, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? You go back, you go back to an agrarian society. We did not draw these distinctions in the same yeah, way. Yeah, I, I am a historian, yeah. and this is one of the major questions I've been dealing with in my classes for about 20 years, by the cool. way. I don't know if you knew this. Yeah, no, yeah. No, no. yeah so, uh, and I've written about it. So pedophilia, the, the identification of this thing as pedophilia and filling that category with all these attributes and traits and behaviors, and then criminalizing it, and then more importantly, you know, attaching, you know, extreme moral negativity on it was part of a broader campaign essentially, you could say, yeah. that Freud has talked about and Foucault has talked about and others yep. have talked about against incest. Okay, so that starts a little bit earlier, a little bit before the identification of pedophilia. Incest didn't exist before the 19th century either. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a new category in the 19th century, and it becomes a new legal category, most importantly. So most historians think, agree, that there was all kinds of sex going on among, in, inside of families before huh. then, and it just wasn't a thing. No one thought about right. it. Or very, there's no record of anyone thinking anything, right. anything of it one way or the other. And then in the 19th century, it became the worst crime. Huh. The worst crime. Now, why is that? Now, we can't, no one can ever prove why suddenly in this moment in history, all these people in these particular countries became, went into a panic about incest. But one of the theories that I kind of suss out in Freud, I don't think he actually really says this, but I, reading kind of between the lines, or maybe I'm just imposing my own thoughts on him, but my thought is that it disrupts the hierarchy in a family. So if, you ha- if dad is having sex with the daughter, who's, who's running the show now? Like, who's, who's in charge? You know, she's huh. now sort of the wife. And this is kind of one of the reasons that, well, we know this about Mormons. Right. This is why they got cracked down on in the 19th century as part of this campaign. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, so the whole, I mean, and by the way, you know, the Mormons have suffered more persecution and prosecution from the state than any group in this country for that reason. It right. was all about um, polygamy. And one of the arguments against Mormons doing this was that, hey, all the daughters are wives. You know, we are about the nuclear family in this country, a clear hierarchy in which children are trained to be citizens by right. leaders. So if you're having sex with your daughter or your son, you no longer serve as a role model, as a representative of the nation state. That's really what parents mm-hmm. were expected to be, representatives and teachers trainers for the nation state. This is how you become Americans, kids. Right. And one thing you do is you have a clear hierarchy because we have a military in the nation state sure. where there's a clear hierarchy. There's going to be businesses you're going to be working in where there's a clear hierarchy. We have government officials who are at the top and we are at the bottom. So if there is no clear hierarchy in a family, there cannot be a nation state, actually. So I think that it's it's very important. I don't think it's just an accident that we that we think incest is the worst thing in the world, and we do. So when I look at Ron Book and Lauren Book and the way that they interact, and you described it really well, and you describe it even better with your camera, <laughs> boy, it looks to me like there might be some other guilt he's working out. Oh, I wouldn't. I'm not. And I'm not I'm saying. Not there, I'm but, not saying it's actual but, sex between them. I'm not saying that, but it is not a typical relationship no, between, is, between father and daughter. There's another photo that he has in his office of him giving a speech to the Florida legislature with her right next to him, yeah. sitting there looking up at him. Yes. You know, with his, his there is, look of admiration. And, and it, it, there is clearly much more going on in their relationship than in your typical American father-daughter relationship. It's totally, here's, here's as far as I guess I'll go on that, is it's totally intense. It's very entangled. It is really interesting. They, I mean, that's right. They work together. They are allies. They are co-crusaders. And you know, who's, and you know, who's, not, you know who's not in your film? 
Yes, I do. I, the mom, his wife. His, his wife. The That's mom. True. Isn't that interesting? Um, <laughs> it, is inter- it, is, it is interesting. She was not, I mean, I, I don't want to sort of talk out of, uh, out of school about it, but um, yeah, she was, she was sort of not really in the, in the picture. Um, and I did not feel the need uh, narratively to try to in any way track her down, in part because the... I'm sorry, track her down? Where is she? She was not. She, they, She's not part of the family. They're, they're divorced. Oh, see, um, I didn't even know that. No. The film doesn't say that. No, we don't. We, Isn't we don't that say interesting? That. And again, I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> spend too much time on, on. So there's a serious subtext there, you know, that I think you. I think you show beautifully, but you don't make it explicit. And I'm not saying you should have. And I get why you. Yeah. Wouldn't, because I, mean, I don't. Let me just not say. Really, how I s- very clearly. Let me just say, I have zero evidence that there is anything sexual in their relationship. And I'm not even, that's not even what I'm arguing here. I am arguing that there's something more importantly incestuous. Psychologically. Yeah, psychologically, emotionally incestuous. That, that seems clear to me. I will s- right. state that categorically, that what you show is an incestuous relationship that is non-sexual. I would, yeah, I, it's just not a word I would but use yeah, to yeah, describe well, okay. it. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, so I think that's actually why I sort of said dyadic. Is like there's this, there's, there's this entangled, entwined, interesting way. I mean it's like yeah, they're co-crusaders. It's like mm-hmm. he has to me the part that's fascinating is the way in which they have taken a tragedy and made it a narrative mm-hmm. and made it an unbelievably compelling narrative to advance a political agenda. Mm-hmm. Now, you can agree or disagree with that political agenda. You can see what they're doing as good or bad, or more importantly, I think, you can see it as effective or ineffective. Because I should say this about the film, like, I did not make this as an advocacy film. I made this because, I made this to start a conversation. Because here's what I think, nobody's talking about this. Not only is nobody Mm -hmm. talking about this, nobody's really even Mm -hmm. capable Mm -hmm. of having a conversation. As a politician, if you say, I think our sex offender laws are too harsh, you are going to lose. And we have, by the way, politicians in the film saying, it is a non-starter. I went to legislatures in multiple states and said, what about this? And basically what they said to me is, you bring me any piece of legislation that seems to be tough on sex offenders, we're going to pass it, they're going to sign it, it doesn't matter. And it's why we have things like in New York State. You can't be a volunteer firefighter if you're on the sex offender registry. You can't drive an ice cream truck if you're on the sex offender registry. Now, I sat down with the guy who proudly passed the ice cream truck law, and I said, just out of curiosity, Senator Flanagan, um, was there like a precipitating incident? So something must have happened. Was there like a kidnapping in your jurisdiction or something? And he's like, no. I'm like, well, but was this? And And he said, look, I know what my constituents fear. I know how they think, and they don't want pedophiles driving ice cream trucks. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, but it seems like a solution to a thing that's not necessarily a problem. Do we have any evidence that this is a problem? He said, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. Now, you can say that's not the point, or you can take the approach that, gee, we should make laws that actually address issues in our society. But the point is, it doesn't matter how absurd, it doesn't matter how obscure, it doesn't matter whether or not there is evidence, whether it is scientifically grounded or actuarially grounded, even if it's not, even if it turns out the social science shows that it's wildly counterproductive, they are passing those laws. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, has, what was the effect of Ron's decision to turn this tragedy into a narrative and use it to push these laws. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted the film to do was frame that question and get people talking about it. Not taking a side necessarily, just talking about it. Yeah, and that's why it's a great film. And I mean that, no, because, and I can see that, you don't come to it with an agenda. You're not making an argument, I don't think, when you start the film. I think by the end of the film, you're making several arguments and you've made arguments publicly since the film. Sure. So, But that's fine. And I think, I really mean that. That's why it's a great film. I am making an argument right. or several arguments. I am not, I, I have thought through this a lot. I mean, I still am open-minded about certain aspects of it, but what you did is you did ask the question that is is unasked, you know, and that's kind of what this uh, podcast is about, by the way. And so that's what's so wonderful about it. So I'm just right now, I'm just 
taking your text, which is pretty sure. open, and yeah. and putting and using it for my own purposes. <laughs> um, but no, I, I do. Well, look, that's why. By the way, you make a movie, everybody gets to watch it. Yeah. And think what they want to think. Yeah, I mean, exactly. that's the beauty of it. And some people love it, and some people don't love it, and some people think this. And I mean, that's the idea: is you try to aim down the middle. Yeah. And let the Ron, know, Ron Book and I saw the same film, <laughs> right? And apparently, we have very different views of it. Uh, yeah. I'm sure he would not agree with my view of it. Um, so, well, here's the thing, David. The reason we have to ban them from all aspects of society is that they are the worst people in the world. Right. Yes. Now that's these are the last pariahs. Now these that's, are the people we hate most. That's the bedrock of all of this stuff, and that is what is never touched, even in your film. Why? do we think of these people? Why do we think of yeah. pedophilia, what we call pedophilia, as the worst thing in the world? Right. It is, right? So um, I mean, I have in our society. Theory. I have, and, I, and so we yeah. do know, as I said earlier, like we do know that that idea that they're the worst people in the world is only about 100 years old. Mm -hmm. It's only about 100 years old. So human civilization is millennia, many millennia old. Right. For, so basically just for a blip, we have thought of them this way. If you tell that to people, they're going to say, oh, God, no, it's always been a terrible thing. Well, no, actually, right. in fact, it's been celebrated in many societies. As a matter of fact, as we speak right now, it is celebrated in many societies in the rest of the world. So in Afghanistan, this happens. In much of the Middle East, it happens, and it, there's no problem with it. In Africa, much of the world, what we would call pedophilia happens all the time, and no one blinks an eye about it. And on top of that, I've never seen any evidence of children later on in those countries saying, oh, God, I was a victim. By the way, let me add this. I know of many, many, many people personally and from reading and from scholarship in this country now who are considered by our law and our culture to have been victims of sexual abuse as children. Right. They had sex when they were children with an adult. Okay. They do not think of themselves as victims at all. Yeah. How many gay men have you ever met? Do you know about this? I mean, I can't even tell you the number of gay men I have heard say their first sexual experience was when they were a boy and they were with a man. Right. A man, they had sex with, and they loved it. I've had them say that in those terms. Mm -hmm. I know someone very, very well, a woman whose first sexual experience was with was when she was 16 years old and was with her high school English teacher. And they ended up having a three-year relationship right. from 16 to 19. She has never once thought of that in any way other than as just a relationship and her first relationship. Right. Certainly, she never thought of it as being a victim. Now, if he had been found out, that guy would be in San Quentin. Absolutely. He right. would absolutely San be Quentin. In, he would be fired, reviled, incarcerated, done for life as a sex offender. Done. That's right. No okay. question. Now, unquestionably. Yeah. You know, there's no question that according to our definition, that was pedophilia. That was you know, you name it. Absolutely. I did a bunch of um, sort of man on the street interviews yep. while we were making the film. You know, when we had when we have an extra. 45 minutes in the, in the shoot schedule or it turns out something got delayed. We just set up the camera sometimes on streets and I just stop people and say, so hmm. I'm making a movie about sex offenders and sex offenses. What do you think? Like, and in fact, we have a little chorus of, a, a chorus of some of them at the very beginning of the film. But one of the ones that I remember really vividly in, in Miami that did not make the film is this guy. And, and he's with this very, you know, sort of, they're, they're both in their, I would guess, mid, late 20s. He's, he's with this very pretty woman and they're holding hands and they do the interview together and he's like oh when i was 14 i had an older i had an older woman oh it was and he goes it was amazing yep. and she's like that's so gross and he's like it was awesome i mean it's this very mm -hmm. interesting thing there's a so, co cognitive dissonance. There's a cognitive <laughs> dissonance and yeah. there is by the way a multiplicity of experience exactly and oftentimes exactly. i think and certainly I think fairly in Shauna's case and in others, there are instances where the children themselves don't see themselves as victims. Mm -hmm. The adults are the ones who see them who see them as victims. Mm -hmm. And so there is a way of taking agency away. That said, isn't that the definition of childhood? Mm -hmm. That's the whole point, right? The reason, <clears throat> when you said like, why is this? The reason that people like Ron and everybody else come back to over and over and over again is their children, 
by which we mean they are defenseless, they are unable to make decisions, and we need to protect them from everything, including from sex or what they think of as, by definition, predatory sex. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a perfectly reasonable mm -hmm. point of view. Mm -hmm. That is certainly a very modern and very contemporary point of view. The question of whether or not, and by the way, you know, as as one as one gets older, and I'm I'm, I'm not young, you know, I, I look at people, I look at kids who are 14, 15, 16, and I think, oh God, those kids should not be making these decisions. <laughs> at the same time, remembering back when I was 14, 15, 16, it seemed completely within my purview and reasonable for me to be making decisions about my own sexual destiny. Yeah, we we but that's a societal decision. We require a total repression of sexuality among people under 18. Total. We require sexual repression for everyone in this society, but for anyone under 18, it must be total, in particular for girls. We can't let them be sexual. We can't expose them to sexuality. Now, who among us was not sexual before 18? It's quite something. Yeah, I'm sure there's some people. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, you know, but there is a very tall brick wall that we try to erect between children and sex. Right. So again, why? And again, that wall is only about 100 years old. Mm -hmm. So well, I can think of lots of well, I can think of lots of good reasons. Yeah. Certainly, when we're talking about girls, that I would not want my own daughter, my own child, to be pregnant at 14, 15, oh, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Keep on counting. Pregnancy right? is a different thing than well, sex. But but there are. But as we well know, they are connected. <clears throat> um, so there are. I, I'm just saying there are lots of good reasons. There are lots of good reasons to be concerned about this. The question hmm. gets way more difficult when you talk about criminalization, and not just criminalization, but a set of draconian laws that are ruining tens, hundreds of thousands of lives. Then we've got a larger social problem to address and a larger set of issues to talk about. Mm -hmm. And you know that's what the you know that's what the film was about is to say, hey, hold on, let's talk about this. Is it smart? Does it do what we want it to do? Mm -hmm. Does it make social science sense? The answer, by the way, is a fairly definitive no on that one. Mm -hmm. Residency restrictions, for example, do not decrease recidivism. The, re the underlying reasons for many of these laws, which is the misperception that sex offenders will offend and offend and offend again, is completely, it turns out, and utterly misplaced. In reality, their same crime recidivism rate is among the lowest of any category of, of offender. It's in the you know in the, three three and a half percent. Yeah, yep. in the largest in the in the largest broadest study three done and by half, the U.S. Department of Justice, three and a half percent of sex offenders have reoffended. Within the in fairness, within the three year follow up yep. period of the study, which examined the largest I, cohort ever, over yeah, ten thousand in multiple states. I'm actually skeptical about that claim uh, because look oh, let, we, wait, we explain well I mean <laughs> that's sort of denying that they have desire for children I mean I think they do I think they are I think they are what we call pedophiles well I mean on. so why wait, 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 wait. We, we've got to draw a distinction here. no I know I know I, I understand a desire and acting criminal well as we know the desire itself is criminalized you go to prison just for the no, just for the desire no, you go to prison for actually downloading for porn possessing if, for possessing yeah. if you don't if all you do is stay in your is is stay in your head, um, unless you you know unless you blow a polygraph or you can disclose in group and say uh, n nobody expects them. We don't get to not to. We know, don't go. We don't go to prison for possessing pictures of us killing other people. No, we look. If you want to get into this, we can go way further afield <laughs> and way worse. Uh, I yeah. You know you you should look at what's called simulated child pornography. Mm -hmm which is when you graft a kid's face on a grown-up's body. Mm -hmm. And that's illegal. I know. Draw, I mean, drawing. Drawing. Is, is it, I know. Yes. This is my point. It's illegal. Like, those are really, so, really, to my mind, those are really scary right. places in the law. And we didn't go there. We didn't go there in the film. We didn't have time. Yeah. But, the, but, but look, it is, because uh, I want, uh, you sort of raised a question about that three and a half, that three and a half okay. percent. Let's talk about that, because it is crucially important, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. that you know, the, that the audience, that people look at the social science, take it seriously, understand just how often it has been replicated, who has done the replication, and realize that while three and a half may not be the number, low single digits 
meaning you know between some have gone as low as 1.7 percent over two years some have uh, some have gone high to six to six and seven percent but we're talking about consistent findings through multiple state studies through federal studies across whether it's Connecticut Alaska you know Minnesota these states have done this work and by the way these are people who are looking to see and justify high recidivism rates among sex offenders and what they find consistently is the same crime recidivism rate is unbelievably shockingly low so low that when you talk to legislators they say things like and this bit's in the film if you told me 95 percent of them would never do it again i'd change my mind mm -hmm. guess what 95 percent of them are not going to do it again yeah no i think it is extremely powerful evidence for the argument that that what is happening is an excessive application of the law. Right. Okay. What I'm getting at here is that I believe, and I bet you do too, that law is downstream from culture. That we yes. have all sorts of laws I on think the that's fair. we have all sorts of laws on the books. You right. and I are both from we both lived in New York City for a long time. We know that jaywalking is illegal in New York City, but everybody in New York jaywalks all right. the time right in front of cops and it never gets enforced. So therefore it is essentially not a law. It's a meaningless law. When a culture agrees with the law, then the law is enforced. Laws are passed because of the culture. So I'm saying, I think your film, that piece of evidence about the recidivism rate constitute just an overwhelming argument, overwhelmingly persuasive argument that this is an excessive application of the law. Okay. So if we get those reforms passed, that's a great thing. I, I am hundred percent with you on mm -hmm. that. I think that Shauna will, you know, shouldn't be in prison, that she will be freed from being on the registry and all, all these things. That still leaves the fundamental problem, though, which is that we as a culture for only 100 years, mm -hmm. right, but we do, think that this thing, pedophilia, is the worst thing in the world. And so if it's the worst thing in the world, and you don't challenge that idea, right? Right. If that goes unchallenged, then... It, this is going to pop up again sure. because it's popped up again and again and again in American history over the last hundred or so, 150 sure. years. And popped up, by the way, in weird other, you know, the, the kindergarten hysteria mm -hmm. cases. Exactly. The mass, the, the mass child rape cases of 25 years ago, exactly. almost all of which have now been shown to be frauds and hoaxes. And, exactly. You know, McMartin, McMartin preschool case, like that stuff. Yes. So there is definitely a hypersensitivity almost in America, among <laughs> Americans, in this culture, yeah. to childhood, to, to the reality of childhood sex, sexual activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's another, by the way, it's, this is not, as you pointed out, universal. And in fact, other countries have taken a very different mm, approach. Indeed. Age of consent laws are much lower. So yeah. in Japan, South Korea, and Spain, the age of consent is 13. Mm -hmm in more than 30 other countries, including Austria, Italy, and Liechtenstein, the age of consent is 14. In France, it is 15, and on and on. In fact, if you look at the list, and you can, everybody can go to Wikipedia, and there's many lists online, you can see the age of consent laws internationally. And the United States, guess what, is almost, not quite, but almost the world champion in having the highest age of consent laws. 18 is, is very high by world standards. There are all, there's just a tiny handful of countries, I believe, who have age of consent laws that are higher than that. So again, this, this is, comes back to, to this question of why? Why do we have this terrible fear of pedophilia? And why in this country, and I mean, I think that this is about deep cultural roots here that go back to the Puritans, and I think it's Puritanism in our country that really is responsible for this largely. Again, if we don't have that conversation, and maybe this will right. be your next movie that you'll do with me, okay. okay, we'll do this together. Because I think, again, I really do think this is a phenomenal first step, and this, it's the best way to do it. Like, if I had come in and made my movie mm -hmm. saying, hey, look, I think we need to talk about whether pedophilia is... Is good. okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that would have gone over... I was going to say, you'd be hard-pressed to do worse than I've done <laughs> yeah, right. in terms of actually getting out and selling the yeah. film. So, but, you know, you, you could join me at zero. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I understand. And I, again, it's, it's the way to go. But I do think that's the next question to be raised. And it's, I understand it's a tough one. It's yeah. the toughest. It's the toughest question to ask. But we've got to do it or else we're going to keep seeing people like Shauna Baldwin in prison and Clyde Newton on, uh, in 
cardboard boxes and all the rest of it. And we're going to see McMartin school cases and panics on and on and on. You know, I want to sort of flag that uh, mm-hmm. for people to think about. I know it's really hard for everyone. It and I, I've been asking this question in my own classes for about 20 years now. And it, it, of course, when I first do, I say, you know, it's there's universal rejection of it. And yes. my students are very upset about it. But we walk through all the all the reasons. And one of the first things they say is, well, it's it's coercive. That's really the fundamental problem right. with so, uh, pederasty, by the way. Pederasty is is the act of sex with a child. Pedophilia is just the desire for right. sex with children. And I say, okay, so it's coercive because it's an adult and a child. And I say, okay, so how else do we coerce children? Do, how, do adults coerce children in our society in other ways? And they say, well, yeah, of course. I say, well, as a matter of fact, that's all we do all day long with children. We are coercing them constantly. We are constantly, by the way, also making children do things for our own pleasure, things that we want that they don't want to do. Like, oh, if I'm a football coach, maybe I'll make my son play football when he's crying under his helmet. Happens all the time. Oh, my daughter, I wanted to be a ballerina. I'm going to make my daughter be a ballerina. She hates it, but I'm going to make her like it. And it goes on and on. I mean, we make children do things they don't want to do for our own gratification all the time. It's a syllogism you will get flayed for. Here's a third one. Okay, I'll just give you this one. Sure. Because I used to live in Park Slope, okay, (laughs) in Brooklyn. Yes. Home Uh, of hipster coercion. Totally. Yeah. yeah, Well, here you go. So what I saw on all these three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds in Park Slope, Brooklyn, was uh, T-shirts with bands, you know, the names of or the logos of bands from the 1970s and 80s. And gosh, how could you possibly be a fan of Kiss, Johnny? Because you were just born when my daddy loved Kiss. Right. So and everybody was so proud of having their little their favorite bands on their children's bodies. What's that about? Right. So that's all fine. All those forms of coercion are perfectly fine, even when it's to gratify adults. But when it's sexual, we draw a distinction. One hundred percent. We draw a distinction between gratifying those urges. Yeah. And whether that's whether that's right and wrong, I leave I'll leave I'll leave to you. But I agree. (laughs) Yeah, I, I, I agree that that's something that's something that we do. It does seem to me, though, that well, first of all, let me just say in other countries when we're dealing with when we're dealing with pedophilia, um, one of the things that didn't make the film was this very interesting program in Germany called Project Dunkelfeld. Huh. I don't know if you know about this. Uh-uh. But, so here, one of the other problems is, and I think you would find this particularly odious, you also can't talk about your feelings or desires. Mm-hmm. Because if you go in and you say, I've got pedophilic instincts and I want to do this, and I went, Ron, Ron Book passed a law that made every man, woman, and child in Florida a mandatory reporter. You have to. If you suspect that somebody is going to be a child abuser, Mm -hmm. you have to report it. Mm -hmm. You have to call authorities, and you've committed a felony if you haven't. So what does that mean? It means that there's absolutely no safe haven. There's no way, if you have these urges, to figure out what the hell to do. Germans take a totally different approach. They have this thing called Dunkelfeld. If you're not actively under investigation or the target target of, of something, you can call an anonymous hotline and say, hey, I've got these urges, I need help. And you can actually go, they will hook you up for free with a therapist who will help treat these urges and prevent you from engaging in the behavior that they that they deem to be destructive. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that's a much that's a much more result oriented policy than the one than than the prohibitive policies that we in, that, that that we have propounded here. Mm. And so it's very inter- it's very interesting and it's really interesting to see how other places how other countries have dealt even the ones that agree that okay we don't want this happening, right? And I'm not I'm not saying like we shouldn't explore the 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 questions that you raised, but I'm saying for me even in the places we agree, can't we come up with saner, smarter policy and what would that policy look like? Yeah, I'm always scared of saner, smarter policies too, I mean, because they end up being, and this is, I'm going to go to Foucault, my man again. I mean, so he, what he said was, you know, the, the ways in which states and political actors exerted power in the pre-modern age mm-hmm. was by putting them, by putting people in dungeons and right. cutting off their heads. Right. He called that the regime of blood. Yes. Right. This co- it's this external, pure physical coercion. That's what we're doing now with sex offenders. We put them underneath the prison. And by the way, 
mandatory minimum sentences yes. for sex offenders in this country. They are spreading across the states. We have mandatory minimums in most states mm -hmm. or many states. And in Florida, the books, Lauren and Ron, succeeded in passing a law that mandates a minimum sentence for all sex offenders of 50 years. Not all, wait, not prison. all sex offenders, but uh, aggra any, but any ag aggravated uh, sex crime against a child. Okay. And, uh, but well, what? But they're, yeah. but they're very proud. I mean, yes. But yes. 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 I mean, so I just want to, you 50 know. 50 years. 50 years, yeah. and they are very proud of the fact that very it is proud the of sternest it. mandatory minimum um, in the country. Yes, 50 so, years. So Foucault said that what happened in, with the uh, dawn of the modern age, was that nation states and all of their agents realized that that wasn't terribly effective. And yeah, that's one of the things right. your film shows. Yes. There is the no- The more advanced the society, the more subtle the modes and means of penal control. There you go. There's, a re Thank there's you, no Foucault. reduction of sex crimes, right? right? Because of all these laws. Okay. Right. So what he said was, instead they said, oh no, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna deploy all these doctors and shrinks and to Cultural. study, that's right. study all these people, study all these people, and more importantly, let them know very intimately and deeply that what they want and what they do is bad. And once they internalize that idea, then we don't need any cops at all. They will do the right things all the time. They'll be good citizens all the time. It's brilliant. That was his theory. I think it he has hasn't worked so well. Something to say for, oh, I think so, it has. Well, I think it's unbelievably effective. I don't think in the application you're describing. I think, I mean, I think honestly, you could look at a modern at, at a modern law firm or corporation and see and and see Foucault's thesis beautiful writ large because you've got these people. You've got these people who have been winners their entire lives. You look at a law firm. Right, they've been winners their entire lives. They thrived in high school, in, in middle school, in high school. Went to the best colleges, did great, got into an amazing law school, did well, got hired at a big firm, and now, by and large, are shrinking, cowardly people, terrified to express themselves to a powerful partner. Why? Because you know the modes and means of penal control have been established so effectively that they just follow the they just sort of follow the firm rules, never buck the trend. Um, work way harder than they want to. Don't feel don't don't feel able to say. You know what? I'm going to go home to my kid now. Yeah. So, so I think you can see. I think you can see it in in that con in in that context. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that the internalization that 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 internalization has made for a completely safe society as he as as he kind of no. Imagined. Of course not. I mean, so what Foucault says is that there are some people who live in the shade. Yes. These are people who live outside of the gaze of power. Right? That's right. And so. We have 800,000 of those in this country right now with ankle bracelets on, those people, right? They, they did something outside of control. They didn't, they didn't internalize this thing totally. I know, I understand some of them didn't even really violate the law, but many of them did. Sure. Oh, yeah. Right? This, is, this is a law, right? No, no, they violated the law. Yeah, yeah. For sure. so that's 800,000 people who didn't inter internalize that. And so pedophiles also haven't internalized it fully. But boy, has this culture internalized it. Yes. This is kind of my whole major point here I've been making for two hours is that <laughs> we have internalized this thing more deeply maybe than anything else because we well, all feel it. Look, even right. I feel it. Okay, I understand I have a 15-year-old son. If I find out someday that he was sexually abused by someone, I will freak out. Right. I will absolutely freak out and probably want to kill that person. Mm -hmm. Okay. So even I, Thaddeus right. Russell, with all these very fancy theories about this stuff, <laughs> you know, have internalized it all the way down into my soul. Right. And so that's a powerful force. Oh, yeah. And my point here is that that powerful force, which is psychocultural, does tremendous damage to lots and lots of people. And not just the people right. we put in prison, but to us. Right. Because it, it, is the, it is a form of sexual repression that is in all of us all the time. Mm -hmm. So... That's the next conversation I want to have, and that's the movie you and I are going to make next. Uh, it's the sequel to <laughs> the sequel. Untouchable. Beyond uh, Untouchable. Yeah, so final thing, couple things, sure. which are more political, I guess, a little yeah. easier to talk about, maybe, I don't know. How do you identify politically, or do you? Oh, no, I identify politically. I'm, okay. I, I'm comfortably, firmly on the left. Uh -huh. I'm, happily, I, I'm happily so. Look, there's... Um, well, how far on the left? Oh, that's an interesting. That's an interesting question. I wouldn't say I'm. I, I, I wouldn't say I'm centrist, and I wouldn't say I'm radical. I would say that I have some some radical, more radical views. Yeah. So I sort of in 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 that in in that spectrum. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure how I could. Hmm. I mean, I can identify politicians I like, theories I like. I mean, the look. 
I think I, I look at the state in certain ways as incredibly repressive, and I look at the state in certain ways as incredibly beneficial and helpful. I am a great. I, I look at. I'll give you an example. And you know, my father's an economist, so I look around and I think, okay, so I get to be a white guy in the most prosperous country at the most prosperous time in freaking human history. I get to live in California mm -hmm. and drive around in the sunshine and the water works and the roads are paved and life is good and food is grown and presented to me. All I have to do is give up 50% of my income for that. <laughs> that seems an extraordinary bargain to me. Uh. It seems like the fetching about taxes, that seems insane to me. And I look at society, I, I look at, so I look at that debate and I literally don't understand how people can be so astoundingly ungrateful, <laughs> at least people in my situation, for the extraordinary, extraordinary luck that has put us in this country at this time. You know, you know, nobody, as a friend of mine said, nobody calls me old peg leg. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not forced, I'm not forced onto a rickety whaler uh, for, you know, I, I mean, rickety whaler or to scrounge for, you know, to scrounge for ants. I mean, there's, uh, so, okay, so in terms of tax policy, I'm fully, I'm, I'm fully liberal. Do I think that the state does fantastic things? I do. Do I believe in democracy? I do. Do I believe socialism is viable? Probably not. Hmm. I love it as a con I love it as a concept. Not sure. It, not not sure it is. It it fully takes into account the glorious and variegated nature of, of of humankind. So does that does that situate me? Kind of. I'm. I think that guns are a stupid losing issue for Democrats. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin. I grew up in Wisconsin. I hunt and fish, and hmm. I I think that. The, that entire that entire debate is an idiotic non-starter. I disagree with some democratic orthodoxy, and but agree with more than I disagree with. Yeah. Well, so all that is a subject for the sequel to this podcast right. that you and I are going to do someday, um, because that's too much to unpack now. Um, I will uh, let's see. So I will say this about it though. One of the things that stood out for me with the film, another mm -hmm. thing, yet another thing, is um, that I'm watching and I'm thinking most of your typical NPR, PBS right. audience will see, will start watching it and assume that the bad guys are going to be Republicans because those are the Christian conservatives and right. those are the ones who really have this problem with sex and they really are the ones who crack down on these things. Well, Not turns so. out, <laughs> turns out Ron Book is a lifelong Democrat, not just a lifelong Democrat, but he is a major Democratic Party player. He is. He's got pictures of him with Bill and Bill and Hillary and all the rest of, and Barack and all of them. And he has been a lobbyist primarily for Democrats. That's correct. Right. I mean, he plays he plays both sides of the aisle. But yes, that and is where he is. Why would Ron Book like Bill Clinton? Hmm. Here's one reason: Megan's Law and other laws that were passed under the Clinton administration sure. that were pushed by the administration under Clinton. That's really at the base of all this stuff. The national sex offender laws that have put a yes. bunch of people underneath the prisons and have put br ankle bracelets on them and put them on these registries forever and ever right. came right out of Bill Clinton and the Democratic Party in the 1990s. And your, your, your film does a pretty good job of showing that. I, it Thank could you. have done a better job. <laughs> but there is not a Republican to be seen, at least on the national level, who's responsible for any of this in your film. I know in Florida it is... And, and across the country, by the way, we I'm not saying Republicans guy. are not yeah, responsible. Yeah. No, 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 that's right. It is, you, and you do show this very, very well, it is totally bipartisan. It is completely bipartisan, yeah. that's right. And, and look, it was one of the choices you make as a filmmaker, right? Well, you make a billion choices. But it, it was crucial to show that there is no organized opposition to this whatsoever. Exactly. And this is, look, the, so you ask me where I am politically, I'm also iconoclastic. That is to say, look, I could have made a movie, a much more palatable film about the drug war, about mass incarceration, about the death penalty. At this point, these are great things that I could have made a movie about and sold and be celebrated and that, all that stuff's great. But what attracts me are the darkest, most difficult, the darkest corners, the most difficult questions, the things that nobody else is gonna do. Me too. And yeah, well, that's, <laughs> and so that's why I made the yeah. movie I made. And yes, I thought it was important to say, look at not just the orthodoxy, the conventional wisdom, but the essential unanimity of opinion on this. 
right? Everybody agrees. There is no organized opposition. There is no rational response. There is no one standing up and saying, hey, let's take a look at this. Let's think about this. Does it make sense? And again, Untouchable, the film, the, the film that I made, and by the way, it's untouchable because the subject matter mm-hmm. is to some extent untouchable. The film itself, it turns out, has essentially been yes, it tells untouchable. Untu- so you, you, told me, <laughs> you told me before we started uh, taping that, that it's basically been ignored by the media and by distributors. Yeah, we've had or a lot of re- trouble. Or not ignored, rejected. Re- re- yeah, re- it's been, yeah, we have not had a good look. I mean, like I said, I think everything, I'm very, very proud of all the decisions I made as a filmmaker. And I think as great as I was at making the movie, I was unbelievably bad and continue to be unbelievably bad. Yeah, but that, that, that cuts against your argument so, to, say that, yeah, to say that you were I, unlucky and that you were responsible for this. Well, you I'm knew going extent, into it. Yes, I knew going in. That you were saying something that, that the was entire very culture. was unpalatable. You're like, a vi- you're like Trump in the, in the deep state. It's like a virus invading yeah. the body that gets rejected constantly that's by right. all the antibodies. That's fighting. right. I think yeah. that's right. That's I, what I you think were. that's right. Yeah. I, 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 it was a really, really hard subject. I knew it was going to be tough. I kind of thought that maybe we would uh, find a great. You know, what's really interesting, of course, is in the in the out here in the media in the media world, what everybody says is we want audacious films, we want challenging films, we want controversial films, and I feel like I have delivered on all of the, uh, delivered on all of those, but it's still just too close to home, too scary. Uh, so thus far, we still do not have a big uh, a broadcast partner. I, I mean this when I say but, it. I think that's about to change. I hope and so. I think I think you're the first step. What you did is the first step. I really do. Well, man, I really hope that's the case. I really do because yeah. I would love. I really do think it's a it's it's a movie not easy to watch, but really hard to forget. It's a film that really sticks with you and really poses some. Everybody I've talked to, uh, the, or the response that I've gotten has really been, man. I've never been forced to think so much Mm -hmm. in a movie. Like, it really got me going. And that's what I want. I just wish we could deliver that experience to more people. It's one of the best and most important documentaries I have ever seen. Well, thank you. That means a lot to me. I appreciate it. Thank you for doing this. It's been great. All right, man. All right. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. If you would like to attend a screening of the film Untouchable, Go to ThaddeusRussell.com slash Untouchable and tell us where you would like to see it. If you like the podcast, you can become a supporter by going to UnregisteredListeners.com. Thanks for listening.